in this field particularly that uh, uh, empathy in healthcare is very important, but mainly have handling technology is even more important. So that that's just goes as a saying that uh, this is not working in any way. I'll advance it here. <clears throat> so it's uh, it goes like a saying that empathy is just what the doctor has ordered, and that's uh, that's what is important from a healthcare perspective. What what are we missing or what are we seeing more? We see a lot of uh, machines over medicines, and we see. You can't see the screen, okay, sure. That's fine. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So uh, machines are taking over a lot. I mean, we have many examples that you see today. Uh, how many of you use Apple Watch? Okay, not many in the room, good. So Apple Watch has this habit of saying your heartbeat is at 99, at 120. For no reason, right? You, have, you, you are absolutely fine. And the moment you see that alert, the technology is so disturbing. And it, it starts thinking that you are already sweating for some reason. You have some issues. So this is where you know we don't empathize with people. Though we call Apple the, one of the biggest design uh, company in the world. I mean, they have they've attained maximum design in the world. But if you look at how they are also missing on certain things, these kind of messages, especially in healthcare, can tremendously kill the whole, whole market, right? And people are really scared. Suddenly when the heartbeat is high and suddenly some, some messages are coming that you, are, uh, you need to slow down, you need to relax for a bit, you need to sleep for five minutes. I mean, it's so crazy, right? And we've, we've moved. It is uh, definitely moved from where it was when it was uh, uh, reactive to absolute predictive. And, and predictive is more of uh, the medicines which, which we were looking at how negative health trends can, like there are many startups and companies whom I know are also working in the US and UK are working on uh, when could a person fall ill, at what age, and what are the types of problems that he would get over time, based on DNA tests and based on uh, his history and uh, the, everything they will come up with these. But again, what could actually, what could we do to proactively avoid those? How can we take measures that we can, uh, you know, who needs to be informed of that risk at what age and how do we address those uh, proactively is, is the aspect that they will look and also very personalized. I mean, these, these apps and these again startups are looking at for one person individual there can be a lot of issues that is coming in through the DNA or through the uh, you know history of his parents and grandparents and how those things can be addressed maybe he keeps abreast with his health fitness right from an early stage or he stops eating certain things or you know there are certain uh, measures that, that the apps are giving him that's more personalized. And again, how to be prevented from happening is, is a bigger challenge. What action can they take for the negative episode that can be awarded? So these are certain things where technology is really helping people. But uh, again, how much of technology should we, as a community of designers, allow to take over? That's the, that's the topic mainly. But how much, how much should we worry about technology taking over, and how much should we not let it take over? Again, we have a lot of um, holistic transformations of lifestyle. So we, we, we think of uh, pretty much uh, machines taking over and holistically there, is a, uh, there, are, many com there are many hospitals, like uh, there's one company, I've written notes, I always forget names. So Contra Costa is the company which uh, in, in Bay Area. So Contra Costa is, the, is a hospital. So they, uh, there are people, there are patients waiting in the waiting room all the time. So they have problems with them. So they have come to see the doctors. But when they go back to those uh, patients and ask them, what is your problem? Surprisingly, instead of saying, you know, I have a back pain, I have some other problems, that is why I'm here. Surprisingly, 62% mentioned that they are having problems because of the access to food. Right? Whatever, wherever they're eating today, wherever, uh, wherever their companies are providing food or whoever is, wherever they're eating today, the access to good quality food is a challenge. So because of which there are people who are having problems. Again, this is also related to maybe some physiotherapic issues where they're having back pains, maybe the work environment is not right. So there is a company called uh, Health Leads. So they're tied up with Health Leads and these, these companies actually tie, bring in a lot of uh, fresh graduates and young from school and colleges. They bring those people as volunteers 
and they, they ask them to sit in those waiting rooms, speak to them and also be a part of emergency, non-emergency, casualty everywhere. So what the hospital is trying to do here is fixing a disease is one, disease management is one. How do we avoid that coming is where they are tying up with companies like these, like health leads, who will come in as the, as the vendors or the helpers sitting out of those waiting areas, trying to understand if food is a problem, they will try and go back, research the issues where they are seeing what the food is a problem, why is it causing uh, these diseases for such people, and they go back and work with those food agencies to fix it. And if it is a work environment issue, they go back to the infrastructural teams, try to make sure that they get whatever facility is required to support these patients. Yes, it is very difficult to address those in Asian countries because of the size of vol or volume of people that we have. Uh, but there, there is already an effort how we can prevent these and how we can change a holistic life transformation. So avoiding disease, avoiding people getting those something is, is the latest trend that they are working on uh, instead of just the disease management. I mean, highly spoken about this is also now in India that uh, doctor-patient dynamics has increased. Right? Uh, today you get an access to doctor. Today you, even some of them have them on WhatsApp in India as well. But doctor patients have a lot of uh, dynamics where, um, you know, CVS pharmacy in US came up with a minute doctor, uh, right, uh, minute clinic, sorry, minute clinic. So this minute clinic is, is, a, is a challenging uh, aspect for the healthcare industry because most often access to doctor was a difficult aspect. Like three to four hours or maybe a week you have to wait for 30 minutes attention of a doctor at anything other than it is emergency. So other than emergency, you really have to wait for a long time. So with that, CVS Pharmacy made across the counter, out of the pocket payment doctors, where, where they are available to prescribe for a general medicine level. Uh, but whatever prescribed medicines, non-prescribed medicines, anyway, 7-Eleven and others have already brought it to on the counter. You can get it on the counter. But anything to be prescribed, CVS has a uh, doctor counters opened. Within a minute, you will be able to access the doctor, and you will be able to. And they are working seven uh, seven days uh, and absolutely 24 hours. So that's a that's a great move which CVS made. Uh, which is again disruptive. So things like that will make a lot of doctor-patient relations better and, and it really improves how uh, doctor-patient dynamics can change. And uh, we've also done some analysis with uh, Microsoft on, on a similar aspect. Uh, we have seen the trends like I think in the previous session also they were talking about empathy with stakeholder, empathy with uh, users as well. So with that aspect, Microsoft, we worked with hospital management systems where we see the hype cycle or the emotion cycle that goes across for people who use those systems. Right? There are systems where doctors use, the nurse use, and the nurse stations use, and the admin use for billing and purposes. But we see the emotions. We went through assessing all of them uh, through a survey and uh, having focus group discussions, uh, some contextual inquiries that we did, where we went to their environment and see how, how they perform these things. But when we see the cycles, the system has so many data entry points and so much of work that uh, Microsoft expects the hospital management team to do that they, their hype cycle used to go, we, we have done an emotional analysis, which gives the emotion level in a day from morning 9 to evening 9, uh, how the emotions go uh, back and forth. Uh, when there is a little bit of stress level, uh, the stress level goes some, from yellow to green to blue. So we have color coded how the, how the uh, you know, emotions are. It goes to high peak red most of the time when, the, when, the, when, the, when there's a lot of patients and a lot of people coming in. And especially in crowded hospitals, it becomes impossible for them to manage. So this is where stakeholder empathy was important and how much of information can we as designers deliver to them intelligently and how much can that process reduce the burden on the people. So we use some, uh, you know, brain uh, mapping analysis, and also we use some Toby for eye tracking devices to bring them on to uh, usability testing labs and see how these uh, emotions move up and down and why, and why, how can we help? If any questions, you can ask me in between. I don't know if we'll have time for the questions. I'll ask. <coughs> sure. No, if it is for a hospital, we take permissions from the hospital and the hospital team to allow certain users, and they are also agreeing and signing up with us, that they will, they will, uh, they will give the feedback. They will allow us to take the feedback. So this is a very confined, signed, agreed 
kind of a user test. It is not going to be in general public for sure. Yes, general public we can't. Yeah. I agree. Yes. So when you test for it, so basically they use it only when they are in panic or emergency or things like that. Right. So how do you test for that? Because in everyday life, when you test for it, when you're, you're doing the happy <coughs> or right. maximum, you're there, you can like try to create sure. a situation sure. and then implement. But on when you actually see the real scenario, they're in panic, they're already in hypertension and things. So how do Absolutely. you create such scenarios and empathize for them and test Right. One, I think for emergency, the video call is not an option, yeah, like first of all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So anything on hypertension or other things, I mean, you would clearly draw the scenarios, right? You would, yeah. the whole product is made for certain customer journeys. Yeah. The journey is depicted that within the 15 seconds of a call that gets on, what happens in that? How would you go about assessing the situations and how would the doctor talk to them? What about the connectivity? What about the power connects? Whatever, all of those aspects should and must have, should be considered. But in any case, these, these tools and apps are not for emergency for sure, but they would have some breathing time to reach the hospital in any case, or at least get an ambulance, or at least get a, a doctor's consent if the person is still alive, right? To take him to the hospital. So maybe that kind, that level of tension would definitely be there as an overall customer journey. Uh, but yeah, scenarios are very important. Personas is important, and when you really test these things, those scenarios have to be. Ro we we play role models, right? I mean, the role plays. Yeah, so, yes, it's one difference because if the surgeon, uh, I have met a surgeon who said that I am busy from the morning nine till the evening seven o'clock. He goes very fast, and very late. And all of this is listening to the complaint of the patient. And so when you are doing a usability testing, he is not in the same kind of state of mind. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. So how are you going to create that scenario? Because if you just call them and have a, a common location testing, so but there he is much more focused. He can think and he can do. Yeah. But in that scenario, He's unable to do, and you cannot put the things you're... That's true, testing. absolutely. See, there is on-premise and off-premise tests. Like off-premise, you just get them to the lab to actually see the functionalities, if the flow is fine, <coughs> if they are agreeing to that, is off-premise. So when you do on-premise, you actually, in between the timing of, like you said, the, the stress level, maximum stress level, is when the test should be allowed. And that is a signed up with the hospitals to do those tests. I mean, if we don't do that, there is no way this application can go on, right? No, it will be come. It, see, this is a commitment from the uh, hospital management, and okay. the, the corporate will allow them to do so. So the doctors have to abide and give us 30 minutes to test that. Okay. Right. So in, there's no way that the doctor will say no at evening 5 to 5:30 at the peak hour. We want to test at the same time. So he has agreed for it, and he has to do that. And we could even set up a window between 5 to 7. We will call you anytime. Right, I mean, this is going to be your life. We will, you are signing into a video calling uh, system where you will be paid for, and you are, you will have to take the calls at any situations. Okay. So right, that's what he's signing off. So you have to take the uh, concession from the hospital. It management. comes top down. Yes. Top down, so yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you don't go requesting doctors. They will never allow it. It has to come from top down, and it has to be an application that they are building as a, as a, and the doctor is signing up for something like this. Right. If he's not comfortable, he's the one who's going to use it in future. He has to also make sure from his point of view that he's getting the right connectivity, he's getting the right attention required, and he's getting, getting the right visibility of the patient. And he's able to do something with it. By just knowing that there is something happening, there is some problem with the patient, there's no point um, you know, just, just knowing. Right? He has to act on it. So either by the time he's talking, an ambulance should be triggered to the nearest place. Everything should be ready by his talking, by the time he's talking. And there's an action also required. Good. So again, uh, this is more uh, integrated patient units, like how we are seeing today. Uh, many hospitals are moving in from uh, just one point. Like we have a five-star cardiac surgeon. Please come to this hospital. We have like five rating. The rating is superb high. He's, he's, he's made, he's the best guy to see for orthopedic and so on. 
instead of that model, the hospitals are moving into a touch point model and a holistic approach. All, in, all practices have to be integrated together. Like if a, if, for, if a person is going in with a breathing problem and he met the cardiology at, to start with, that guy understood a lot of case about this guy and he cannot just refer him to a lung surgeon and get off it. So he has to be part of it. He's the first touch point and he, it's important for him to take through the journey of, of this patient continuously with the hospital. So if he refers to the lung surgeon, perfectly fine, but he's supposed to monitor this case until this is either admitted or it's exited. So that's how the integrated uh, practice units have come into play, where the rating systems and measurement systems of hospitals are all, are all moving in from an individual doctor branding perspective to a holistic hospital brand perspective. The hospitals are happy to do this because they get a brand visibility by doing this, but not the doctor himself. If the doctor moves, the patient also moves. With, to the other to the other brands. Again, uh, we spoke about uh, machine uh, machines and uh, humans. So this is again how much of AI gets uh, gets into human. AI is being too much like we know chatbots like this typical scenario what you are talking about. If in an emergency. How many people want to talk to a chatbot? It can act fast, it can probably give you solutions and all of it. Uh, it can trigger an ambulance, it can do a lot of better things than a human being. But absolutely at an emergency time, without even one IVR or a voice, uh, a voice coming in, they want directly a person to pick up. So it's very important for any systems to make sure that there are humans uh, in places where it is required. So this balance is very important where we clearly understand how much of the uh, technology should be allowed from any apps or anything that we are designing, even hospital management systems or the apps that is outside or the fitness apps. Everywhere there is a human required. Without analyzing a person's BMI, there is no way nutrition can just be a chatbot that is um, suggesting uh, the diet for a person. It's impossible. So there has to be a lot of human intervention in the beginning. Maybe to manage the course that is proposed by a dietitian can go on on a, on a robotic mode. But definitely this balance is something, it's the onus is on us as, as all designers that we have to make sure that we, we do not allow technology to overtake uh, beyond the point. Right, and again on a uh, little bit again, on cybernetics, this is more of uh, uh, technology is technology and human being we've been talking about, but cybernetics is a concept of how much of technology is allowed per the compliances, right? For if you're doing something on uh, um, healthcare or uh, it can be aviation industries or any designs that we're doing, there is a lot of standards and compliances to be followed. So with that, how much of technology can be allowed and how much of humanization can be uh, taken care of is purely on cybernetics. So immersive experiences for all is something that we have also been working with many, um, many customers on this. Right? Uh, immersive is a concept. It's more of a using five senses of a human being. How can we immerse person into something? For retail, we have done those boxes that uses that you get into the box your five senses are triggered within the box. Like there is a radiation or a, or, or a LED and stuff that, that takes care of the heat and how the system would work. For example, if you are in a, uh, if you want to feel like you are in an Amazon forest, the VR will take you to the Amazon forest. The sound will make, make sure that you are in a forest environment. And the sunlight based on how you are seeing the picture on your eyes is, is how the, your body gets heated up. And you can also smell the gump. And if the elephant is getting closer to you, you can smell the uh, elephant smell closer to you. Uh, this is also used in retail where you get into a perfumery shop, you can smell like 700 perfumes and buy online. This is more uh, online, offline, uh, physical and digital, the true digital mix where we can bring in the concept of digital into this. So this is mainly being used in healthcare. Uh, the best part of this technology is they are curing traumas. Like if you have a height phobia or if you have any other traumas that you want to cure, these immersive technologies are really helping uh, to treat people better, uh, to get off their fears by not really going into the realistic fears, but actually simulating the fears.
for example, G is trying to do something on uh, um, on the on the trauma cure using immersive technologies. Right, so uh, there are two, three aspects. Immersive is not just that box that I said. It is using five senses and using tricks to play to cure traumas with using technology. So like uh, anybody with a height phobia can actually walk through an, uh, an edge of a large building and uh, you know they have created a physical environment which has the, uh, I'm sure you would have played those games in, in one of those uh, 5D, 4D thing. It's similarly in hospitals, there is a recreation of those where you can walk, make the patients walk through that. And they're very scared. It's not like normal people. They're very scared to even do one step. So over the time, they reduce or increase the heights based on the uh, visualization that is available for them. And they make them get used to it. So this is not really taking them to the top and doing it, but actually using the technology in doing it. And, and, and many, many other examples on immersives for, uh, uh, for others where children can't get into MRIs. Right? While any scanning has to happen, this children will never get it. It's, it's claustrophobic, it's scary. But they have done, uh, the whole MRI was redesigned to look like a Batman cave. So then they started venturing. They were given, uh, you know, plastic guns to start holding on to them. That's their tools to go with. And then they have to stay there quiet for, uh, you know, five minutes to get the uh, back minute attention. Something that, you know, it's a, it's a trick way to simulate and get the purpose done again. So this is again, we call in our languages, uh, this was part of Howard uh, thing also where it says the jobs to be done. As long as you know what is that one particular job to be done, uh, then you are very clear about the solution. Uh, simple examples which Clayton Christen always says in Howard is, uh, um, you know, there, there's a purpose of, the purpose of buying a drilling machine is always to, for dr drill a hole. As long as you know the drilling the hole is the purpose, that is the only one job to be done. Even if you give him 15 other functionalities on the drilling machine, he doesn't care. For him, the purpose of the job to be done is just the drilling one. Right? So it's very important for us to balance between technology, human being, expectations and empathy and all of our stakeholders, business, revenues, all of it comes. So, which is why I've written a book on that called uh, The Great Balancing Act. And I'm launching this here today at 4.30. So, I would request all of you to be there. Question? So, a question on the previous. Sure. <coughs> Sorry. So, yeah, we can talk, yeah. Yes. So in terms of psychology, are you talking about, um, I mean, fear is a psychological issue. Like the trauma that I was talking about, the height fear is, is a psychological issue. I'm, I'm trying to think of some examples that can help you uh, understand more on psychological mode. So again, in depressions, there are different levels, right? The first level, second, and third is that they're, they're ready to kill themselves. So first level is they're very good outside, they're still fine. So the first and second level can be treated uh, by making sure, see this requires, again, the technology is one aspect. There is a lot of research that requires and personalization. So this requires his lifestyle. We need to understand how has he grown up, what has all troubled him. So how can how can we bring in some, uh, you know, uh, what was the tool? I forgot a tool that that you can have a you can have a friend companion, right? There is a there is a robotic friend that you can make. Uh, there is an app. One of the startup uh, one of my friend has done it. So he uh, he's developed an app that is called uh, I'm not getting the name. I'll give the name. It's an imaginary friend whom you talk to. And it gives you responses. Uh, it's an AI-based imaginary friend. It gives you responses the way you like it. It slowly assesses you as a person and understands your psychological issues, what you respond to how. And as a person also, he's not talking to the real person. He knows very well that you're talking to the robot. But that way, he's, he's willing to be a little more open than a normal person. All his shyness will come out of it. So these, th that way, you're able to avoid uh, the depression moments by giving him what he wants. I mean, if he dislikes something, the robot will make sure he will criticize that to the extent he feels happy. So end of the end goal is to make him happy. It doesn't matter how he criticize what.
that could solve Sure. I think in, with, the, with the interest of time, probably we can take it offline. Uh, any other last question? Sure. No, they can't hear you. I was ask, asking about the application you talked about, uh, that we are assessing the person's habit or the state of mind. So what is the initiation of point? I mean, the person knows or the application knows that he is already suffering, then we are you know, assessing it, or it's just natural? It's just natural. It's just natural. You, you, you are trying to build friends because today a lot of virtual friends are helping. There's no real friends. So that way, virtually, they are trying to just play around. But the AI is trying to assess you if you're normal. If there is any issues that you are constantly you know, on, a, on a very dark mood, and you always, uh, if people are posting a lot of agony-based uh, pictures on their Facebook and uh, Instagrams, is one of the starting triggers, where they are looking at life a bit more in a depression mode. So these AI-based tools can actually help starting assessing them playfully. And then you know uh, get this. Even we, we've done some applications even for uh, in, for the U.S. market where uh, for differently abled children we are building Disney-like characters which are in virtual reality. So they are actually taught through their education happens on the virtual reality. They also make friends with those characters, and those characters become a part of their life. So they start you know trying to uh, how much of attention attention issue can be won. So how much of attention can we rebuild for the child because it's just playing a game. So for, for the child, it's playing a game, but as a purpose, it's trying to build at more attention. So you bring it back with the character, you bring it back to the same thing that he was doing and so on. There is a series, uh, there is one episode on Black Mirror, yeah. where Miley Cyrus has uh, experienced yeah, has exactly what you are saying, but yeah. it's on a negative, negative side. side. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, exactly what you have been yeah. saying. Yeah, I'm only trying to make it positive. Black Mirror puts it very negative. So Black Mirror says all this will kill you. <laughs> but yes, the only people who have control is on designers. Yeah, <laughs> I would say only designers have this control. We have to be the gatekeeper to not let technology touch humans beyond a point. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.